Once again to the corner of Glenwood and Lunt, the somewhat chilly corner of Glenwood and Lunt. Yes, it is fall, but it is warmer by the lake. And so, just so you know, you're listening to the Live from the Heartland show with Katie Hogan and Michael James. I was getting there. Up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe. I was getting there. So it's a chilly weekend. It is uh, 11 years ago this weekend that the U.S. invaded Iraq. There are veterans against wars gathering all over. We're thinking of them. We're hoping that they are healing and we commit ourselves to no more war. No more war. All right, Michael, we got a good show lined up today. We do. We have uh, three wonderful guests. We're going to start it off with our good pal, Michael Deutsch, uh, out of the People's Law Office, who's worked on a number of cases, and he's got one that he's going to share with us now, resulting from the NATO demonstrations this fall. And, oh, look at that microphone making a jump. And then we're going to have, um, i got to say, we're going to have some uh, relatives of mine coming on, and... Uh, Koya Paz, the uh, director and playwright, will be up here talking about uh, her new play that opened last night. And then uh, Caitlin Parton, who's uh, an activist around disability issues and uh, a law student now in New York, but came out of I think University of Chicago. She's a lawyer now. No, she's not. She's a law student. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> she's going to talk to us about some things that are on her mind and that encourage us to pay attention to. So let's. Uh, as some people would say, without any further ado, et cetera, et cetera, let's get it going. And okay. good morning to you, Michael Deutsch. Good morning to you. Good get up close. Yeah. He's in. Okay, I'm here. Michael Deutsch uh, has an incredibly uh, great, uh, honorable track record of defending um, the Bill of Rights and uh, our access to it and uh, our rights as citizens. Um, You've been with the People's Law Office for uh, how over long? F over 40 years. Jeez, man, you started the sucker. <laughs> I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> <laughs> you represented, um, among others, the the Attica prisoners, Puerto Rican independentistas, and uh, Palestinian Americans falsely accused of terrorism. Uh, this case that uh, we were just talking about before we came on the air is uh, a stunner. Why don't you? Atrocious. Uh, it, it is pretty atrocious. Why don't you share with our listening audience what the heck is going on this time? Okay, these are this case involves three young uh, members of Occupy who came to Chicago to protest the NATO summit that was here in May, and uh, they drove up from Miami, um, and they were. Uh, about 10 days prior to the uh, demonstration, the main demonstration, which was on Sunday, the 17th of May. And uh, as soon as they arrived, they were uh, went to the Occupy headquarters and were learning about what Occupy Chicago was doing. And they were befriended by two older, uh, a man and a woman, who started meeting with them and talking about doing uh, acts of uh, vandalism, essentially, politically motiva motivated vandalism. And over a 10-day period, they began to have these meetings and talk to them about it. Nothing was ever done. And then sh uh, three days before the big demonstration on Sunday, these three guys, uh, under 25, the guy I'm representing was 20 years old, they were disappeared. They were arrested by the police, disappeared. And for three days, no lawyer could find them out. We didn't know what they were charged with. And then on Saturday morning, the morning before the big demonstration, they were brought to court. The state's attorney handed out to the press a five-page type statement accusing them of terrorism, uh, raising all these wild allegations against them, and asking for $5 million bail. And these uh, nothing was ever done by these guys. Uh, this was all talk initially by these two older people who turned out to be undercover Chicago police officers pretending to be Occupy members and demonstrators and basically uh, entrapped them and brought them into this uh, uh, a conspiracy of something that never happened. And in fact, what happened was, uh, because there was nothing that ever happened, these uh, undercover cops were urging them, let's do something, we got to do something, and ultimately they, they got them to make what three uh, bottles of gasoline, which were they called uh, Molotov cocktails. There was no plan as to what to do with them, and as soon as they uh, made these uh, bottles, 
the, they called in a raid and hundreds of police officers came to this apartment and arrested them and charged them with uh, material support for terrorism, conspiracy to commit terrorism, and nine other felony counts. And essentially they're looking at a possible hundred year sentence uh, after there was nothing ever done and it's all based on the goading and activities of the uh, undercover police officers. Michael Deutsch, uh, doesn't uh, the charges of terrorism usually, uh, isn't it the purview of the federal government? Well, this is a very interesting aspect. In almost 95% of the cases, terrorism charges are brought by the federal government who have some resources and know what to look at terrorism. But in this case, the feds who were involved in the beginning of the investigation walked away from it. They said, this is not the kind of terrorism case that we bring. It's not terrorism. You mean the phony kind. Yeah. It, they do bring those, too. But this was so phony that even the feds wouldn't even bring the phony kind that they, they bring. They wow. said, you do it. And this is the first time under an Illinois law that had never been used before, uh, a terrorism law was passed after 9-11. In 10 years, it had never been used before. And this is the first time that the state, the Cook County State's Attorney, or any state of Illinois has used this charge. And here's what terrorism is defined under Illinois law. The intent to coerce or intimidate a significant portion of the civilian population. Now ask yourself... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that again. The intent to intimidate or coerce a significant portion, a significant portion of the civilian population. Wait a minute, I do that every time I go out to knock doors for Obama. Well, yeah, it's fairly broad and very vague. <laughs> and Not coerce. And, well, yeah, a little coercion. And, and ask yourself what it means to be a significant portion of the civilian population when nothing ever happened. Nobody ever even knew about it, and the only reason anybody knows about it is the press that was created by the charges to begin with. What significant portion of the civilian population was terrorized. Mike, let me ask you, who's, uh, who do you think is making these decisions? Is it the mayor? Is it someone under the mayor? What Would is it be a, Anita Alvarez? I think it's a combination of Anita Alvarez and the mayor made this decision because what they wanted to do was to create a climate of fear prior to the big demonstration that was going to be held on Sunday. And so by uh, uh, letting these terrorism charges out, they're saying to people, there are going to be violence in this demonstration, there are going to be people that are going to be committing uh, violent crimes, and therefore you should stay away from it. And they wanted to blanket the whole Occupy and all the people that were demonstrating against NATO as somehow involved with terrorism. Uh it was a psychological ploy by the state's attorney and the mayor. I, w I was at that march on that Sunday. I marched in that march. I don't think it worked. Well, it didn't work. There it were like 25,000 people marching at least. Actually, it didn't work, but maybe there would have been 50,000. Yeah, Who that's knows? right. Uh, we actually talked a lot about this on this radio station before the events themselves about the various uh, chatter uh, trying to do exactly that, encourage people to be afraid to stand up for their rights, to be afraid to protest, to disavow, to distance regular folk, if you will, from the act of bringing your uh, concerns to the streets, which concerned me a great deal, that, that we become a society less able to just say, okay, it's time to hit the streets. And it's regularly time to hit the streets. Thank God the, the teachers recently showed us how again. but. Um, for these They'll kids. probably get brought up on terrorism charges. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later. A coerce or intimidate a significant portion of the population. Yeah, those students population. are there. So. Mike, let me ask you uh, about the, uh, the three young fellows that are charged on this. Uh, the one that you're dealing with, I don't know if you want to share with us who the other lawyers are, if we can get any people's names, but how are these young guys holding up? Because the, the young fellow that you're uh, handling his case, he had never been out of the state of Florida before. Yeah, he's a young Welcome guy. Welcome to Chicago, he, dude. He just Are these working class kids, they're, college students? They're work, very much working class kids. He comes from a family with a single mother. There was a lot of uh, drug addiction in his family in the past. He's been in and out of school. He had, But what happened with him is he finally began to get some political consciousness. And That's that was, good. that was caused by Occupy in Miami. So he started going there and he began 
began to see all the issues and he began to relate to them. And he said, hey, I want to go and be part of this demonstration in Chicago. Let's drive up there. And he had no intent to do anything other than to be a militant in this demonstration. Oh, come on. He was probably looking to get some, you know, nookie, too. Uh, He's 20 years old. That's well, in the anti-war th yeah, movement. Yeah, think about we how all. you guys were when you were 20 years exactly. old. Exactly. And, and uh, <laughs> so um, now he's sitting in the Cook County Jail on a million five hundred thousand dollar bail Jeez. his his mom is a working single mother there's no way they could raise anything near that bail he's in isolation in the jail um, he's in the jail the three of them are all split up uh, yeah all split up they don't have any co uh, communication other than when they go to court then they can seize each other in the lockup are, are you in communication with the other two lawyers? Yes. Yeah. The other two lawyers are Paul Brayman, who's a longtime political lawyer in the city of Chicago, and Tom Durkin, who's oh, Tom. Uh, yeah, yeah, who's represented a lot of different people charged with different types if of If you were a gambling man, what do you think will happen on this case? First of all, I would tell you there's no way they can convict them of anything having to do with terrorism, okay? Good. Um, and therefore, the most serious charges are going to be either the result of an acquittal or at the end they're going to have to drop the charges. The other charges are more difficult because they're charged with conspiracy, and conspiracy is the prosecutor's dream. That's when they you don't have to actually commit a crime, you just have to agree to talk about it. Let me just give you a little flavor of the nature of what this... Uh, uh, talk was about and I'm listening to the tapes that the that were these undercover cops were wired and their tapes of their conversations at one point they the cops are talking about well let's do something at the Obama administration to protest Obama you mean the campaign headquarters, yeah, the campaign headquarters downtown so mm -hmm. they say to our three guys or two of them at least, why don't you go out and do a recognizance of the Obama headquarters to see what kind of things can be done there. Break a window or to put some glue in the locks and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll talk about it. So the next day they meet, the undercover cops say, well what did you learn about the Obama headquarters, what you can do there? They said, oh we couldn't find it. <laughs> we said we googled it but we couldn't find where to go. So this is the kind of, you know, kind of crazy cops and stuff they're talking about. They're, they're suggesting things and all the things they're suggesting are essentially doing stuff of a vandalism manner against the police. Breaking windows of police cars, letting the tires, the air out of the tires of police cars. And at one time, they, um, the, one of the guys who's attributed to my guy says, I have a bow and arrow. Why don't I fire an arrow with a message on the arrow at Rahm Emanuel's house? So <laughs> then it, what they say in the, in the press release... Tempted murder? You know, they tempted to firebomb Rahm Emanuel's house. Bomb Rahm Emanuel's house with an arrow with a message on it. So they've created terrorism out of vandalism, or not even vandalism not that even. occurred, right. but talk of vandalism, and they're put these poor young guys who are just new to politics uh, in it'd a be, situation. It would be laughable if it weren't for yeah, three guys yeah. uh, rotting in jail yeah, right now. It's, well, yeah. I'm, I'm the, the, the two things that I, I, I assume that this will uh, go forward and that uh, I'm a, a, an eternal optimist and I, I hope it will work out for the three young fellows. But I'm, I'm really concerned about uh, the political structure in the city with uh, with Rahm Emanuel and Anita Alvarez. Uh, let's, on the case of Emanuel, we just had a situation uh, this past week where uh, the Occupy people who went into the Lincoln Park uh, or Grant Park and uh, wanted to be in the park after 11 o'clock, which oh, yeah. we've always thought is reasonable. I mean, it's particularly on a hot summer night when you get forced out of the park by the police. Um, and Emanuel, uh, once this was thrown out, Emanuel said they were going to challenge it. And I'm just wondering what Wait, his... Yeah, I don't think you were clear. It got thrown out in court this week. Yes. So what you're talking about is Rom's response Rahm's to that. Rom's response was, we're going to challenge They've it. They've already filed an appeal and, notice. And why is that? Is he doing that? And Anita Alvarez, we tend to, to already know that she, uh, you know, she came out of the state's attorney's office. She's been a part of it for a long time. There's like a lot of very negative things associated with that office. And uh, she appears to be, you know, a, a grandstander and going for publicity and certainly very conservative. Yeah, Anita Alvarez is... 
a part of that culture of the state's attorney's office that's yeah. not interested in justice. It's more interested in convictions. They've been very slow to deal with the torture cases. They've resisted a lot of people who were tortured and giving them new trials. Um, and this whole NATO prosecution shows her mindset of, you know, playing to the press, uh, exaggerating charges, uh, setting up people with the Chicago police, using undercover police officers to create crime rather than to stop crime. So that's a problem. In addition, the judge this week, in a case that our office was involved with, found that the statute which prohibits people staying in the park after 11 o'clock was unconstitutional. Not only unconstitutional on its face, but as applied to all these occupied people because it said that it's a selectively enforced. When, when, they, when the city wants to have a big rally like they did when Obama was uh, elected, right. they allowed people to stay in the park, in Grand Park, as long as they wanted. Yep. The judge also found that the city was screwing around with Occupy and t giving them mixed messages about what they could do or couldn't do, right. and actually guided them to Grand Park, told them they could rally in Grand Park, right. and then when it came time for the curfew, they just Slam. arrested them all. Slim now, I was involved in the lead up to the uh, NATO um, demonstration with meetings with the city, uh, with the police, with the corporation council about the rights of the people to protest.